Hello, and welcome to the Loving Faithcast, a VR chat podcast for both Christians and non Christians to listen to. So, I wanted to go over something today that's so common, yet it goes over everyone's heads. The definition of God is usually left open in the air and unclarified when Christians and non Christians talk with one another. They just kind of assume that the other party knows what they're talking about when they speak about God, when, in fact, it may very well be that both people have a completely different definition of God. I think we Christians need to keep this in mind, that although we have come accustomed to the way we know God in our lives, non-believers might have grown up in a different setting. In other words, there's no guarantee that they know what we mean by God. I think one of the biggest things this community needs is clarity. And what I'm talking about today is a prime reason why. For example, the atheist you're speaking with might scratch his head when you say there's good reasons to believe God exists, but that's only because the God they picture in their mind is a physical, Zeus-like, demigod figure who's maybe sitting on the clouds in the sky with lightning eyes and a white beard. And this difference in what both parties mean by God may go completely unannounced throughout the entire discussion. So something we need to keep in mind as Christians is that not everybody knows what we mean by God. And I think if we're to win lost souls for Christ, we need to be careful to clarify what we mean with certain terms. Terms that, although we might think are common sense and plain to everyone, may very well be outside what our non-Christian friends have heard throughout their life. I'm going to clarify what we Christians mean by God. When we speak of God, we're talking about a non-physical mind. He is a person. And when I say person, by the way, I don't mean what we usually mean by person, a human being. When I say God is a person, I simply mean he has the mental faculties sufficient for personhood. He has thoughts, intentions, a will of his own. But on the other hand, he's immaterial. He's not made out of physical parts. Now, just by that definition alone, this clears up the air on whether or not he's a Zeus-like figure, because Zeus is made of physical parts. God is also someone who is unlimited in power, knowledge, and goodness. This is what sets God apart from every other god that's been brought up in human conversation, because all those other gods are finite beings with limits and deficiencies. Zeus, for example, is powerful, but has a limit in power and goodness. He's not maximal in his abilities, and he has moral imperfections. On top of what we have so far in our description, I want to add a fifth one. God is also an eternal being. He was never created. He is an uncreated being. This isn't just some attribute we're creating out of thin air, by the way. Many philosophers over the past centuries have recognized that Whatever was the first cause of our universe has to be something that itself is uncreated. Otherwise, we would run into what we would call an infinite regress of causes, continually asking, what created that? And then what created that? Ad infinitum. So it's perfectly rational for us to believe it's possible for a being to be eternal. And that's what we mean by a god. Again, this sets God apart from the majority of the other religions that praise lesser gods who themselves have a beginning. So, to sum up the definition we have right now, what Christians mean when they talk about God is that God is an eternal, immaterial mind who is unlimited in power, knowledge, and goodness. Simple enough, and honestly, it doesn't have to get more complicated than that. But I'm convinced that a plain definition of God like this can serve to clear up plenty of unannounced confusion in the minds of our non-Christian friends. For example, I've gotten this question a few times in my conversations, but non-believers will ask me, who created God? But that kind of a question presupposes that God is a created being like us, that he had a beginning. So understanding that God is eternal dissolves this question. Some people also think that God is the same as the universe. But again, this simple definition of God will make plain to them that's not at all what we mean by God, because he's immaterial and eternal. But the universe is both material and has a beginning, so it can't be God. I hope with those examples I've shown that presenting this definition of God will clarify what we mean when we're in our exchange with non-believers. And for anyone who's not a Christian who's watching this, I hope this has cleared up for you what we mean by God. 
Now, how do we bring this into practice? How do we apply this to our next talk with our non-Christian friends? I think we need to only simply ask them if they know what we mean by God, and ask them what they think our definition of God is. Once they describe God, you can easily spot the red flags to point out by saying that's not what we mean when we say God. Then you can go ahead and give them the simple definition I presented today. God is an eternal, immaterial mind who is unlimited in power, knowledge, and goodness. And you may have to further clarify what it means to be eternal, or to be an immaterial mind, but simply clarifying what we mean by God, I think, can solve a lot of problems before they even arise. So now that we have the basic understanding of God, I want to further clarify some of the concepts that I've brought up. Let's start with the description of being unlimited in goodness. The concept of morality is something we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Whenever we make choices in our lives, especially when it's our choices of how we treat other people, we're constantly bombarded by this thing called good and evil. We have the choice to love or to hate, to forgive or to hold a grudge, to be patient or to be impatient. We recognize that there exists these virtues that are common to all mankind. No matter what part of the world you're in, the virtue of love is always going to be a good thing to possess. Not even the virtual world a lot of us hang out in is void of these moral choices. Even on VR chat, we all know the vice of being malicious is evil. I need to shed some light on the words virtue and vice. What I mean by virtue is simply the habit of making a particular, morally good choice. So the virtue of love is the habit of genuinely seeking the good of another person. Vices are habits of making certain choices that are evil. When given the choice to be patient, a person with the vice of anger will instead lash out. None of us can say with a clear conscience that we've lived a perfectly good, virtuous life. By the way, on a side note, if you enjoy this kind of VR chat podcast content, be sure to subscribe and like the video so that I know to make more of these. Anyway, we've all fallen prey to the vices that are common to mankind. Deception, lewdness, maliciousness, jealousy, wrath, drunkenness, narcissism, manipulation, selfishness. But what if there exists a possible being who is completely unspotted from evil and is absolutely virtuous? This being would have to have a rational mind in order to make moral choices. This being would be perfect. Again, to clarify what I mean by perfect in this case is someone who is maximal in all of the virtues and is not guilty of committing any evil. This is what we mean by God, a person who is unlimited in goodness, or in other words, perfect. And the perfection of this being, I'm convinced, is the reason we experience morality at all. Just think about whenever we accuse someone of doing wrong. He stole my avatar. He cheated on me. She's stirring up drama. She's being a hypocrite. Whenever people say something like that, they're saying that this person has not matched up to the moral standard. A moral standard that not only do they believe in, but one that they expect the other person to know as well. The moral law is something we believe everybody ought to adhere to, and the person accused may even reply by defending themselves, trying to explain how they haven't actually broken this moral law. But you see in both the accuser and the defender that both are presupposing there's a transcendent moral standard that ought to be followed. Now, the only way this moral law can actually exist is if there's a transcendent mind who is morally perfect, who is the grounding and source and standard of moral goodness. So this experience of morality has led many philosophers to recognize one of the most famous arguments for God's existence. For anyone who wants to understand the moral argument, I'll gladly point them to the first chapter of the book Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And they can also look up on YouTube the moral argument given by Dr. William Lane Craig. But today I won't be defending the moral argument itself. I simply want to clarify what I mean by God being unlimited in goodness, and to show how it's perfectly rational to believe that that's a possible thing that actually exists. The other description I wanted to further clarify is God's unlimited power. When I say that God is all-powerful, I'm saying that God has the ability to do anything that is logically possible. 
Now, the specific wording of that is intentional, because people have brought up many times something that's known as the omnipotence paradox. Can God make a rock so heavy he can't lift it? This question on the surface sounds very clever and easy to understand, and for the Christian who's untrained with this kind of reasoning, they're going to be caught off guard. Long before I took my walk with Christ seriously, this is something that stumped me as a teenager. But the reason God can't do that isn't because he's not powerful enough, but because the concept of a rock with such infinite weight it can't be lifted by God is a logically incoherent sentence. It's not even a thing. To describe it with another example, let's take the concept of a square circle. This isn't something that can even logically be possible, because a square circle is contradictory in its nature. A 2D shape can't both have edges and be completely round. It's not that it's hard for a powerful being to make it, it's that it's not even a thing. Just because we string words together in a sentence, that doesn't mean we're talking about something that can actually logically exist. So when a person asks if God can create a rock so heavy he can't lift it, they might think they're raising a good point, but they're just giving out an incoherent sentence. In other words, the fault isn't on God for not being able to perform this task, the fault is on the person who thinks this is a coherent task that can actually be described. Now, again, my goal is to simply illuminate what I mean by God being unlimited in power. God has the full ability to do anything, but that only includes things that are logically possible. Something that isn't logically possible isn't even a thing, and therefore doesn't make God any weaker because he can't do that. I also think, since our universe began to exist, that the thought of something being supremely powerful isn't a thing we have to take by blind faith. Whatever made this universe, it's got to have the power to do it. The ability to make something rather than nothing. Without the first cause having power, there would be no universe. But since there is a universe, this thing has to have some sort of power. Today I showed you guys the importance of clarifying what we Christians mean by God, and followed that up with a simple definition of God. God is an eternal, immaterial mind who is unlimited in power, knowledge, and goodness. Then I shed some light by giving a more detailed explanation of what I mean by God's unlimited goodness and power. God is the transcendent mind who is the grounding, source, and standard of goodness, and has the ability to do anything that is logically possible. And I'm convinced these five descriptors of God are rationally defensible. We have very good reasons to believe there actually exists a being who is described in these five ways. And this banishes from our minds the confusion of other gods. God, simply in his nature, is on a whole nother level compared to all these other entities, because the vast majority of them are described as finite, limited beings. And so on a side note, I think this is a good answer for those who are confused because of all the different religions that exist. The reason we believe in God rather than these other deities is because we have good reasons to believe there exists a being who is eternal and unlimited in power, knowledge, and goodness. And we don't have comparably good reasons to believe in these other beings who are limited in those aspects. Well, that's all I have for today's podcast, so thank you guys for listening. And also, if you have something to comment, maybe an idea of something you'd like to be talked about on this channel, please send it over and I'd be happy to read it over, and perhaps bring this up in a later discussion. But with that, I'll see you guys in the next one.